If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. I'm very happy to be introducing Dr. Peter Huntington today. Actually, he's not an introduction because he's been here before. Dr. Peter Huntington was on episode number 244. Dr. Peter Huntington is a vet who specialises in equine nutrition and conducts ongoing research and investigation into the nutrition of horses, and he's also the Director of Equine Nutrition of Kerr Australia Division. Now, Peter, today we're going to be talking about 10 Tips of Basic Feeding Principles. Is that correct? How are you anyway? Yeah, very good, thanks. Good, thanks, Gwen. Good, yeah. good. So, um, you know, and uh, this is a really important, uh, I mean, it, the topic sort of sounds very dry, but uh, if you get the basics wrong, uh, then you can do all the fancy things you like in the world and uh, the horse won't have a, a proper feeding program. Yep, yep. And I think we've got a, a wide variety of listeners, and I know that you advise people with their top performance horses, but these are the basics that we need to get right. So these are really relevant to everyone with horses. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone, mm-hmm. everyone mm-hmm. needs to needs to worry about these sort of things. And uh, yeah, particularly uh, in times of drought in a lot of the country, where uh, people need to uh, change the way they uh, they feed their horses because they don't have as much grass to eat, or hay becomes very expensive or or unaffordable or, yep. or unavailable. Okay. And uh, so uh, you've got to sort of go back to basics to uh, to work out uh, the best plan to follow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. So the first one we've got is adequate forage intake. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah. Well, the horse evolved as a sort of grazing animal with, for most of the year, I guess, um, you know, enough pasture to eat or, or, or grasses. Shall we say grasses to eat, not pasture? Yep. And uh, grasses are foragers. They're uh, full of fibre. The horse ferments the needs the fibre for its digestive health and it ferments it as an energy source and um, many horses can live perfectly happily on on just forage. Uh, So the horse needs a certain amount of forage and where you have problems is when people start feeding concentrates or hard feeds and they don't have um, adequate supplies of available pasture or you have green pasture that's very short and there's not much there, Mm -hmm. or or you have dry pasture that's not there either, like you do in a drought, and they have to supplement uh, forage, and that's usually in the form of hay or chaff, and uh, very often they're they're not fed enough. And many racehorses are not fed enough forage. Um, The horse, they need the absolute minimum of of 1% of their body weight per day. So our typical 500 kg horse, which is, is... not so typical these days because the introduction of all the warm bloods and things like that, lots of ponies, you know, there's lots of bigger and smaller horses than that, but they're needing absolute minimum of around, uh, you know, five, uh, five and a half kgs of hay. More ideal, if you're feeding at all, if you're feeding hay and chaff, more ideal would be one and a half percent, so a body weight's up around eight kgs okay. of hay, or you're using a forage-based concentrate. Okay, okay. All right. Now, the next one you've got, this is number two, is feeding to meet the workload. This is where you start to introduce other things, is it, you know, we've got the forage and this is where we start to introduce other things or can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, that's correct. As horses work harder, horses at maintenance, Mm -hmm. they're doing some moving around the paddock if they're in a paddock, and that exercise is actually good for them. It's good for their digestive health, their mental health, and it it, it is some sort of uh, exercise. They need more energy than they would if they were just standing in a stable or a yard. Now, when we we put them um, into work, uh, they're uh, exercising at greater speeds, for longer periods of time and so require energy to fuel muscle contraction. And so that means that um, you've got to supply that. Now, some lightly worked horses can meet their energy needs on forage alone, but um, there are, as the intensity of work, either the speed or the du- or the duration goes up, you often need to add concentrate feeds uh, to meet the energy uh, 
their energy supplies. But what's most important is that people don't overestimate the amount of work they're doing. And, you know, walking and trotting around for, 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 for 20 minutes or something is not hard work. So while a hard-working horse, e.g. Uh, a base horse or endurance horse or perhaps a top-level three-day eventer might, uh, or a hard-working polo cross horse, might need double the energy that they need at maintenance and therefore uh, a lot more concentrates, you know, your average uh, weekend warrior that's ridden for a short period of time mainly at a walk doesn't need that. One of the problems you get with overfeeding energy is that uh, leads to behaviour issues. So overfed horses, um, and particularly horses that are, are not worked hard enough, are much more prone to behaviour problems or issues or risks of laminitis. Yep. So, Peter, when people are introducing the more energy, the more concentrate, is this where we lose the forage intake? Because you said there was a bit of a problem with our racehorse trainers introducing the concentrate to get the speed so the horses can work harder and win, but then they lose the forage intake. Is that what the problem is there? Yes, it is in that there's a sort of perception that if uh, you feed horses too much uh, too much chaff or hay, too much forage, they won't eat their concentrate. Mm-hmm. And uh, often it's the other way around because when they're, when they're fed uh, enough forage, their gut, um, their, their stomach and their hind gut function well and uh, that doesn't have an effect on appetite. Whereas if you've got a dysfunctional stomach with gastric ulcers or hind gut with acidosis, then you have reduced appetite. So uh, there's some misconceptions about uh, the impact of um, adequate forage on uh, appetite for concentrates. Okay, okay, good, good. Now, if we move on to number three, which is your body conditioning scoring, can you talk a little bit about the background of the body conditioning scoring, how it was evolved? and um, even where people can get a copy of the body conditioning scoring that we're talking about? Sure. Body conditioning scoring is a a sort of semi-objective assessment of the the body fat content of horses. You know, it's equivalent to the sort of, I suppose you'd say, you know, the BMI um, that um, uh, that we, um, you know, a number that we're used with human health, Mm -hmm. which is looking to, assess how how thin or fat you are. And it came out of other animals and the actual body, Australian-based body condition scoring system was something that I devised um, in the early 1980s uh, with uh, the help of some other other vets, particularly Dr. Lex Carroll. And uh, so we devised this, uh, we modified an English system to make something that applied to horses of different sizes and we have a sort of zero to five scale with half points and zero being very, very poor, obviously that horse is very sick or not being fed enough, and five being very fat, and uh, the five, the very fat, and both of the ends of the spectrum are unhealthy. And these days you seem to see more horses in the uh, fat end of the spectrum. Fat is uh, four and, uh, and above, uh, then we have four and a half and five. And they're really unhealthy situations, and you have a higher risk of... Uh, a number of uh, metabolic disorders, including laminitis, or including equine metabolic syndrome. So there is also an American system, which is a one-to-nine system, that, that follows a similar sort of chart, um, and that was devised for quarter horse, around quarter horse broodmares. So it's, it's used in a number of countries of the world, but the Australian one, the zero to five one. And, and the relevance of it is that it's a guide to how thin or fat the horse is, and therefore, how uh, is it in the right body condition for the sort of exercise regime it's doing? Yep. Because that will vary according to the the exercise. It, it, it's an indicator of fitness. And the second is, you know, are you are you overfeeding energy or, or, or underfeeding energy? So, if horse is losing body condition, then uh, there's a relative energy deficit to the supply and demand curve. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's gaining it, well, it's you know, got too much energy. And so it is one of the things that people can use to assess the suitability of their feeding program. They can't, people can't tell, you know, how much um, vitamin B2 their horse is being fed. I mean, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, they can't look really at, you know, the intake of, um, of something like zinc. They can't measure that. But you can 
uh, and both of those are important nutrients, but energy is much more important and particularly for the performance course. So you can look at the body condition and you can look at changes in body condition and then go, well, you know, I want to adjust the amount of feed that I'm giving so that I maintain the horse at the right body condition. Okay, good. I think that was a good explanation. Now, now where you can get it, there are... The zero to five system um, is published uh, in, in a variety of places. The State Departments of Agriculture, I know, have, uh, have um, sort of what used to be called ag notes with reference to it. Um, my book, Horse Sense, has a section on it. Um, Copyright's Feeds, who actually sponsored the original research, uh, had some horse weight estimators that a slide rule thing that I devised uh, where you can use, it's got body condition score tables and you can estimate weight based on girth and length or height and body condition score. And so they're, they're certainly uh, still available, I know. So uh, a, um, feed stores that sell Copyright's could possibly get them. Yep. Um, but um, yeah, there are a variety and a variety of books have, have used it. Okay, okay, good. All right, the next one, number four, is feed by weight and not volume. And we're talking about the weight of the horse or the weight of the feed. Well, we're talking about both, actually, there, Gwyneth. So uh, the horse's weight determines uh, how much um, how much energy it requires or how much protein it requires. All of its nutrients are linked, or linked around weight. So your uh, 600kg horse needs, you know, one and a half times the amount of feed the 400 kg horse, if they're doing the same work and have the same metabolism as it were. Yep. But um, it, it also uh, refers to the weight that you put into the feed, be it hay, uh, be it chaff, be it concentrate feeds. And people tend to feed by dippers, I mean, that's a practical um, thing to do, but they don't realise that different feeds have different weights in the dipper. And sometimes they think that, you know, one dipper of, uh, one dipper of, we call them dippers, you know, other countries call them scoops. Um, but a dipper of uh, chaff is a lot lighter, say, than a dipper of, uh, of a grain yes. or uh, a, a processed food. And people often don't recognise the differences uh, between them. Uh, so a, dip, a chaff dipper that might be sort of 250 grams, the same size dipper will be one kg of grain, maybe a bit more of pellets, a bit, quite a bit less of extruded feed. And so they think, you know, they're feeding four dippers and it's, therefore they're feeding four kilos of feed and they go, well, why is the horse too thin? Well, because a lot of those feeds are in fact less, um, you know, you're just feeding less weight. Mm -hmm. So periodically, you know, or when you're setting up your feeding program, weigh out your dippers so you actually know how much you're feeding because when I do the calculations about how much concentrate a horse might need um, to meet its energy needs and, and other nutrient needs, protein, minerals and vitamins for a certain type of work, then I'm doing that in kilograms, not in dippers. Okay, okay. Kilograms or grams. All right, good. And I think that's a good tip, particularly if the horse is putting on weight or losing weight, just to go back and, and measure, as you said, measure the weight of the dipper. Yeah, that's right. And and the weight of the hay. You know, mm -hmm. There are people um, who who sort of think, oh, I'm feeding an awful lot of hay, but in fact, they're very small, you know, one kg, one kg biscuits. Okay. Well, the hay is lighter. You know, the weight, when you're buying hay, you want to be buying it, you know, it's the dollars per kilo. Yep. And, and the dollars per unit of energy that matter. Mm -hmm. So don't just think, oh, I'll buy, you know, this hay is a dollar or two cheaper a bag, a bale, but it's five or six k's lighter. Yes, yes, okay. And I, I think some of, you know, I know working with people who are buying bulk hay, one of the things they do ask is how many bales per tonne. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. What's the weight of the bale? How many bales per tonne? That's yep. what you need to be buying. Mm -hmm. Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats.com, and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right, the next one we've got, number five, is keep meal sizes small. Yeah, the horse has got a different sort of digestive system set up to, mm -hmm. to say, other animals or to humans. For example, and uh, that's because of where they evolved with the readily available forage, and they were, as we said earlier, or I should have said, you know, they spend a long period of the day eating, you know, 12 to maybe 18 hours, 18 hours in you know, a lactating meal that's got a high energy net and protein needs, um, 
and uh, perhaps but you know twelve hours, and that's much more than a cow or a sheep would eat for, and certainly you know much more time a day than a um, than um, other animals would eat for. And so what it means is that um, you need to follow that in in the, when you set up the feeding system, uh, particularly, and that's because the horse has a small stomach. Uh, food moves out of the stomach relatively quickly into the small intestine, and it particularly applies to concentrates. Um, because uh, many concentrates have got quite a lot of starch in them and the starch is meant to be digested in the small intestine. That's a key energy source, particularly for harder working performance horses. Uh, The starch is meant to be digested, but the horse has a limited capacity to digest starch. Mm -hmm. And if the meal size is too large, then that will not be digested in the small intestine, will overflow into the large intestine, be fermented to acid and start to wreak havoc on large intestinal function. So there's sort of rules of thumb about uh, about meal size and um, particularly if you've got starchy-based feeds and the basic rule of thumb is about you know half a kilo per 100 kilos of body weight uh, is, is thought to be a, a good, safe rule of thumb for meal size. Now, there are some... Some around, uh, if you get a bit more sophisticated, some might do it around starch content, uh, but um, that's a sort of basic rule of thumb. If you're feeding any sort of concentrate, you know, no more than, you've got a 400 kg horse, no more than two kilos being fed at, at any one time. So how many times a day would a 400 kilo horse have, say if the 400 kilo horse or 500 kilo horse was stabled, how many times a day should they be being fed? Well, that. That depends a bit upon what you're feeding them. So if you were feeding them uh, just hay yep. uh, and a small, very small amount of concentrate, you could feed them, give them you know, one, one feed of concentrate and leave hay in front of them all day long. Okay. Um, and that's the ideal. The ideal scenario is that leave hay. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you've got horses that are stable or in yards because they're too heavy mm-hmm. and they're being fed restricted amounts of hay. So uh, you need to, rather than letting them eat all their hay in a couple of hours, you need to give um, spread the hay out. And so, okay. um, yeah. right. so, you know, we tend to talk about, say, your, your 400 kg horse doing, you know, reasonable sort of amounts of work, mm-hmm. um, you know, might be fed twice a day. Racehorses probably should be fed three times a day or maybe even four times, um, but practicalities of labour and, and things like that mean that they're not. Yeah, and I like the way you say the practicality. We can say a lot of things in theory, but we've got to put it into our day-to-day use as well, haven't we? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. I mean, people go to work or school or um, they're, they're not there. They're doing other things. Sure. And it's surprising, actually, that in other animals, uh, automatic feeding systems have evolved so that uh, you know people with um, chicken sheds don't go around you know, putting the feed in the feeders. It drops in automatically. Mm. And uh, I have seen them for horses, but they've never really caught on. And that would be a good way of feeding your horse, you know, trickle feeding your horse, um, yes. as it were, but uh, they haven't caught on yet. <laughs> okay. Um, that might be a good one for someone who's a bit in it to be who's, uh, listening to the chat. Yeah, to invent, invent something. Exactly, exactly, yeah. All right, number six is make feed changes slowly. Yeah, the, the horse has got... Um, sort of complex bacteria system of um, and population of, of bacteria and protozoa and things like that in its large intestine, mm-hmm. um, which ferments fibre, and uh, that becomes a source of energy. And that's a really key part of the um, it's uh, of the horse's digestive system. Uh, it also has bacterial populations in the stomach that do a bit of fermentation. And so when you change the type of feed, you sort of change the bacterial population. So uh, studies have been done, the term microbiota, which is actually you know, the, the health of that bacterial population that's actually linked with a number of disease states, and it's a, it's a growing area where we're finding out more and more about the influence of the bacterial population in the gut on, on health. Uh, but you change that with different feeds. So what you need to do is make changes slowly so you allow the horse's uh, digestive tract and particularly the bacterial population time to adapt. You don't have these sort of changes overnight. So even if you were changing the type of hay being fed, 
um, from, say, grass hay to loosen hay, then you want to do that slowly because you, there are differences in the bacterial populations with the two types of hays. Certainly, if you're in, introducing concentrates or new mm. concentrates, you want to do it slowly. Now, if you're changing from one pellet and feed to another pellet and feed, well, that's probably not going to matter too much because they probably have similar ingredients. But if you are changing from a grain-based feed to a pellet and feed or increasing the amount fed, you want to be doing it you know, over 7 to 10 days, making the changes stepwise uh, in, a, in a sort of slow fashion. Okay. All right, good. And now number seven, you've got following feeding recommendations on the back of the bag. Well, this is sort of thing done with a bit of a caveat. Mm. Uh, it's about, you know, a lot of people use prepared feeds these yes. days and they're a convenient way of feeding the horse. I um, mean, you know, if you if they're fed right, you don't need to add too many other supplements, perhaps apart from salt and obviously the forage that we mentioned early. And w- when we design a feed, we sort of think about um, how, how it should be used and we fortify that feed with vitamins and minerals, vitamin mineral premix. And we sort of say, well, you know, this type of horse will feed this amount. So our 400 kilo horse is going to be fed four kgs of this feed, to take an example. Yes. Um, and that means we put certain concentrations of, of, of vitamins and minerals or protein or, or fat or something like that in there, certain levels of nutrients. Um, which means that horse will have what we think is a balanced diet if they're the normal horse and fed with appropriate forage. And what happens if um, the horse uh, is only fed two kilos? And very often that's the right decision because the horse may be too fat mm-hmm. on the foot or yes. may have too much energy, you know, may, may have more energy than these four kilos. What happens when you feed uh, two kilos? Well, they get half the amount of minerals and vitamins in particular. Mm -hmm. So that means a diet that might have been nutritionally balanced isn't now, and you need to top it up with a supplement. So generally speaking, if someone wants to feed two kilos, they're better off you know, looking for another feed which has is designed to be fed at two kilos a day rather than cutting a four kilo feed down and feeding half of it. Now, you can fix the problem up by adding... um, adding extra supplements, but then the feeding program becomes a bit more complex. So in general terms, try and follow the recommendations, but if your horse is too fat or too thin or doesn't have enough energy for work or is too much bucking you off, then you've either got to change feeds or, or change intakes. Yes, yes, and putting those other supplements in sort of takes away from the simplicity of having that yeah. prepared feed. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and that somebody it's been designed by somebody that generally knows more than you are about what nutrients and horses need, etc. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Now you did talk about it about making up the shortfalls in vitamin or mineral intake through the inclusion of supplements. Let's just thinking about a situation I knew of where adjustment horses were getting a special type of prepared feed, but then it was oh my horse is the same thing, a bit fat, fucking me off, whatever. So the adjustees would then use varying amounts of the prepared feed. So tell us a little bit about making up the shortfalls in vitamin or mineral intake. Yeah. What could happen there? What what happens, as as you said, is that the horse, um, that's a vital part of managing your horse, is adjusting the concentrate intake Mm -hmm. to meet the horse's energy needs to maintain it in the right condition, to give it enough energy for work and not too much. And that has an impact on on uh, inclusion or intake of the minerals and vitamins, particularly that are included in the feed. So we have a situation where uh, the horse will, um, you know, some horses might be getting four or five kilos and some horses getting two kilos. And so the calcium intake, the copper intake, the selenium, the vitamin E are going to vary. And if you're going to do do that properly and feed that horse properly, you'll then top up the two kilo horse with um, a sort of like a, a perhaps a half dose or two thirds dose of a suitable supplement. Okay. Uh, you often don't need a full dose, and that's where you need professional advice. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the alternative is, well, you change to another feed that's designed to be fed, or has a lower energy feed, or is designed to be fed um, in the way you want to feed your horse. Okay, good, good. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com.
You're talking about specialist advice here. Is that something that Kerr does? Can people contact? Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, we have advice. Um, other other feed companies do. Mm. The contact number for us is one eight hundred seven seven two one nine eight, or you can email advice at ker dot com, and uh, the Kentucky Equine Research. I think we offer a good new, good uh, feeding and nutrition advice service. Uh, to people, so if you have queries oh, right. uh, or you want to see how you uh, you know you can balance a diet, uh, is your diet balanced? Is it supplying all the nutrients the horse needs? Then um, yes, we can we can give that advice. Great, and we'll put those details on the horse chats page as well, just in case people have missed them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next one, Peter, feeding supplements according to special needs. So, what type of special needs would we be talking about, and what type of supplements? Supplements. Well, I think uh, the one that the ones that come to mind are things like um, hoof health. Does your horse have um, poor quality hooves with cracks, um, with uh, slow hoof growth, uh, with slitty toe, and are they going to benefit from needing a biotin, zinc, and methionine supplement like, say, BioBloom, which is our one, which can uh, help increase the quality, increase the amount of hoof growth or the quality of hoof they grow. So not every horse needs that. Some horses are fine. Um, and that's where your adjustment situation, you know, you may want to add a supplement to your horse, but the next door person doesn't. Mm-hmm. Electrolytes are another one, um, which are added to feed uh, to replace uh, what's lost in sweat, or at least the mineral part of what's lost in sweat. And they are, um, you know, the, the the electrolyte needs depend upon the amount of work the horse does, and really the amount of sweat the horse loses. And two horses can do the same amount of work and be very different in terms of their sweat losses. So, um, because of uh, different fitness and, and metabolism, so electrolytes will vary. Um, joint supplements are very popular these days, and uh, so if your horse is showing signs of joint disease or you're particularly interested in prevention, you may want to feed that, whereas a horse with normal joints um, or, or uh, joints that, that haven't uh, started to deteriorate uh, doesn't need it. So there's a few situations, um, ulcer supplements or gut health supplements. There's a number that, that um, things for nervous horses, no. So there's there's a number around where people feed supplements that are, are really special needs. Every horse doesn't need them, mm-hmm. but every horse does need um, some added vitamins and minerals over what's in the the basic forage and the um, you know the concentrates, the, the basic concentrates they need, and they can either be supplied in a properly formulated prepared feed mm-hmm. um, or in yeah, a good, in a supplement. Good. All right. Now before you you did talk about the practicality of having horses. You know that people can only feed twice a day sometimes. And you've gone on now to number 10, which is practical feeding, feeding in a herd situations versus individual paddocks. And sometimes people have only got, you know, those herd situations. Sometimes people just say, well, this is the best place I can keep my horse that's close by that I can see it regularly and that's what I've got. So what can you say about that? Well, and, and horses are uh, horses are herd animals too. Mm, They'd rather mm. be in a, a group than on, be on their own. And so if you've got your horse in that situation, either you've got to bring it out to feed it yep. individually or it, where people are feeding groups of horses, they've got to remember the effects of packing orders. Um, and that's a, you know, a dominance thing. Mm. One horse will be the boss. And uh, one horse will be at the bottom of the pecking order and they'll all be at all places in between. And that boss horse will want to keep showing the other one it's the boss by um, kicking it off its feed bin and going, I'm going to eat your feed. Yep. So where if people have horses in groups, they need to have feed bins. And rather than having them in a line, a straight line, yes. which is sort of tempting, you know, along the fence, you put them in a big circle so that as horse, the horse that gets kicked off the sort of bottom feed bin doesn't have to walk all the way around to the top of the line to get back onto a feed bin. Okay. Um, and also the other good good tip is to have one more feed bin than there are horses. So you, you've sort of always got a spare one there. Mm. And that means that, um, you know, you're going to minimise the uh, influence of packing order on, on intake of feed. Now, horses eat at different rates. So you'll see some horses eat faster than others. And maybe that's why, you know, they're, they're fat and the other horse isn't, but um, you can't change that. The only thing you can then do is take an individual horse out 
And if you've got a group situation and one horse just isn't doing well in there, then you've got to often look at going, okay, I'm going to take that horse out and perhaps put it with another horse and uh, give it a bit of uh, special attention at TLC. Yep, yep. It's good watching the herd behaviour too, isn't it? You know, sometimes you get the boss horse and they they hog two and they you just watch them and you watch the characters and you watch who's the boss and, yeah, it's just lovely watching them, yeah, absolutely, watching absolutely. them feed. Yep, yep. It's, it's important, but it's important that every horse gets a crack, gets mm. a, a crack at the feed bin. Yep, mm. yep. All right. Now, Peter, what's the best way to contact you? You talked a little bit before about those specialist services at Kentucky Equine Research. What's the best way? Again, you did say the number, and we'll put that number on horsechats.com slash Peter Huntington too, but just go to horsechats.com, search for Peter or search for Huntington. We can do that. Um, 1-800-772-198. Yes. Or emailing advice at kr.com. I'll also draw people's attention to the library we have, a searchable library on our website at www.ker.com. And we've got a fantastic uh, resource of articles on equinews.com. So, and people there can um, sign up for a fortnightly newsletter that comes out uh, into their email and has a number of articles of, of, of interest. Or they can go there and search for something that's of particular interest to them. Yep, perfect. All right, that's great, Peter. Thanks again for coming. Thanks for sharing your time, sharing your expertise. And I'm sure that our listeners will be very happy to have all that extra information from you today. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Grant. Bye-bye. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 